Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. CEO and founder of Virginia-based Aransi, a pioneering air purification company and chair of the Association of Home Appliance Manufacturing Air Clean Council. Please welcome Peter Mann. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I have the CEO of Aransi, Peter Mann. Now, Peter is a serial entrepreneur who has successfully bootstrapped two companies with no outside funding. Peter's present company is a leading U.S. designer of manufacturing of air purification products for consumers, schools, and businesses nationwide. He started designing air purifiers at night as a side hustle while working full-time during the day and is executive at Dell in the early 2000s. He is a U.S. Navy veteran. Peter, thank you so much for your service and a former Dell executive, as I mentioned. Now, Peter's first founded at Austin-based Allen Corporation in 2002, a company that designs and manufactures indoor air purifiers, and then Peter sold that and then founded this Virginia-based new company. Peter, you have some experience, my man. (laughs) <laughs> Thanks, Gabriel. I, I'm yes. I'm excited for you. Now, before we get into our on scene, we talk about that. I would love for you to introduce. Now, I kind of get a little background, but I would love to hear from you. Give us who is Peter Mann? Wow, that's a pretty open-ended <laughs> question. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll just jump into my like business background. So, uh, I mean, I went to, to college and really didn't know what I wanted to do. And I wanted to go to a good college and didn't want to have debt. So I, that was the, the reason why I went on an ROTC scholarship and, you know, led me to going into the Navy. But my my degrees in more math and statistics. Um, and then when I got out, it was pretty interesting because, you know, this was um, early to mid 90s. And, you know, at that time it was pre 9-11 and if you had a military experience, nobody really cared. (laughs) So it was, it actually uh, kind of a good thing. Um, But it, it, it kind of um, made me really kind of hone in on kind of what my skills were. And so for 10 years, I kind of worked at two fortune 100 companies, tech data and Dell. Um, And that's really where I got my, I call it MBA on the job experience. I didn't have, I never took a business class. I didn't know anything about business and so I, you know, put in the time to really understand like how businesses work. And, and, you know, I got to work in some operations and marketing roles. And then when I was at Dell in the early 2000s is when the dot-com bubble burst. And it was just every two weeks we were laying off people. It was, it was not, it was not a fun place to be. And that was really the push I needed to go off and start something. And I co-founded, um, you know, e-commerce business and, you know, air purifiers was one of the products. And we, we actually sold some other products. Um, and this was the early days of, of e-commerce. But from my background, I was at Dell and we were, you know, I was developing functionality for Dell.com and uh, I was involved in the Dell printer launch from a marketing standpoint. So I knew how to bring products to market and I knew how to market and sell online. And so... Um, In the early 2000s, it was interesting because what you saw in the other categories was a bunch of mom and pop shops. And so I was used to competing with HP and Compaq. And then you're competing with, you know, this (laughs) this little shop. And so we we actually did pretty well. And the timing was 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 great. Um, And we built that up. And in 2009, I sold my half to my business partner to really dig into air air quality because my son struggled with asthma and it really left an impression on me to help him and people like him. Um, And, you know, we've we've grown through the years and COVID was really kind of a game changer in terms of air quality awareness (laughs) and air purification. Um, And in 2000. 21, we merged with an electric motor company. And so right now we're focused on reshoring our manufacturing. 
uh, back to Virginia uh, with air purifiers. And longer term, I see us branching out into some other categories since we have uh, electric motor technology that, you know, the, the sky is the limit as to, as to what we do. So I'm super excited uh, about the future. Nice. Now, you know, one of the things you mentioned, you know, you kind of got your MBA just by working, right? What yeah. made you decide to just say, you know what, I'm just going to be an entrepreneur. I'm not going to the corporate world. I'm just going to do my own thing. Yeah. I mean, for me, I, I always had I, the need for autonomy. I just, it was an issue. It was a lack of confidence. It's like, uh, am I a poser? Am I <laughs> like, um, how, how do I do this? And so for me, having 10 years of a corporate experience just gave me, like, I, I understand the basics of, of how things work. Um, you know, and, and if I could do it over again, you know, maybe I would do things differently now, but you know, you can't, <laughs> <laughs> but if I were someone that was just starting off and wanting to go off into my own, I mean, at that time, it didn't even occur to me that was something you could do. <laughs> it's like, but the internet and technology has really changed over the last 20 years that, that, make, that makes that possible. And so I think if I were to distill it down is really just understand a customer problem and find a way to solve that problem better than someone else. It's really that simple. Um you know, you can get caught up in technology and you can get caught up in other areas. But at the end of the day, it's like somebody needs to buy your product or service. And ultimately, it's better if they can tell somebody else about it. And if you really solve a problem in a unique way, there's just so much value um, that, you know, I think that's that's a great way to grow a business if you're starting off. It's just, you know, figuring out what that what that idea is. Yeah, that's a very great point. You know, everybody, I think throughout this uh, podcast, what we really try to focus on is, you know, identifying a problem that is actually a, a consumer problem. I think we all have problems, but I think you also have to have that right product market fit. And you seem to have done that, right? You One of the things you mentioned was your son and that that passion for him and, and his need for air purification. Tell us about that time when you decided to go ahead and sell off your other business to start that new business. What made you go ahead and do that leap outside your son? And and two, how do you really differentiate yourself from the other pure air purifiers out there? How do you kind of create that brand? Yeah. So um, what's interesting is, so I was in a 50-50 kind of ownership stake in the business. And, um, you know, as you, as you go through the years, um, it's, it's normal. It's almost like a marriage, right? And you have your ideas of what you want to do, and the other person has their ideas of what they want to do. And at some point, if there's a conflict, it's 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 almost like a, a bad marriage. And so when I talked with our lawyers, you know, they're like, "Yeah, this happens all the time in 50 50 business <laughs> arrangement." So I would not have done a 50 50 business arrangement, um, knowing what I know now, if I could go back and and redo things. But that was part of the conflict because you get into a situation where what I see as an investment for the business for the future, the other person doesn't see the value and it's just a cost. Right. And then over time, it, it's just, it, it's not great. And so it was, it was partly as like life's too short to be miserable in your own company. And so I'd rather sell off what really what I've built to, to start over, but really solve the problem that I wanted to solve. And, you know, with my son, when he was an infant, he just, you know, struggled so badly with um, asthma. It was, it had such a big impact on his quality of life and, and mine and my wife's as well. Yeah. I mean, yeah. everyone was impacted by yeah, this. When bet, yeah. Your child can't, your infant child can't breathe and they start changing colors. It's yeah. Like, oh man, I could not even imagine. Yeah. And so it's like, there's got to be something we can do. And and then, you know, what they give is steroids to, um, yep. and that just you know, uh, does, does some crazy things. Does, and so does, that's, yeah. that's, that's, so um, like, what can we do that, that kind of just cleans the environment? So he's not triggered into an asthma attack. And, you know, that kind of gave me just a lot of, you know, passion and, and drive to, to make it happen and to do things in the right way and not, not take shortcuts like, um, you know, it, with COVID, there's everybody and their brother seems like they got into the air purification business with just because it was an opportunity. And for me, it's not about making money. It's about solving problems and helping people. 
Um, and so it's, it, you know, I think that that kind of separates us a bit from some of the other folks because we're not going to um, take shortcuts and we're going to be authentic and we're going to be transparent <laughs> about what their product does and doesn't do. Um, and that's that, that's not typical in, in at least in our industry. Yeah, definitely. Now, one of the things you kind of mentioned, you know, the difficulty of the the partnership um, also having, you know, the lawyers can we kind of briefly talk about the importance of that? Because I think this is a great thing to, for entrepreneurs to understand. Having the legal structure in place to ensure that individuals know what their role is. Can you kind of talk about that and how you created your structure? Yeah. So we had, fortunately, what they call a buy-sell agreement in place. And that's, you know, if, if someone's not happy or, you know, because, you know, if you if you form a, a company and you have two people and you have no legal structure around, it, it's it's really ambiguous. And how does yeah. one person leave or what if one person just decides, hey, I, I'm, I'm done working, I'm going to do something else, but I'm still a 50% owner. And so you have uh, what they call a buy sell agreement that basically just lays out this is kind of what happens if somebody wants to leave or um, and that's really important because then you're just managing to whatever their program is and in a good business lawyer that's looking out for you know everyone's interest can can draft that up you know pretty easily it's a standard document um, but I would say that that would be the the key to have in place um, you know in you know <clears throat> I think it's also better if you have two people, one person's maybe 51%, the other's 49% and, or have a third person that's a tiebreaker. Um, mm. I think that's a, a better scenario because sometimes um, someone's just hard headed about something and, you know, if the other two people, you know, can overrule them, it's, <laughs> it just, you know, alleviates, I think a lot of conflict because yeah. the, the, the goal is to be successful. And the last thing you want to do is, is have infighting <laughs> with very your, true. with your management. Yeah, that's, that's very true. The quicker you can kind of get to a resolution, the faster you can kind of move forward. I, I completely agree. You know, one of the things you mentioned was you kind of wish you knew some things before uh, the partnership. What, what are some of those things that you wish you would have known that maybe, you know, today, that you wish you would have known before you started that partnership? Well, one was just the the challenge of being in a 50-50 uh, relationship. It's, it is really like a marriage and you have to treat it as such and, and, and really just don't let things fester um, that, you know, can, can contribute to bigger issues down the road. And so um, I think um, just being open and communication is really the key. Um, to the whole thing. But I think engaging with a business attorney um, that can kind of shed light because they know the horror stories of what can go wrong. It's almost like a marriage counselor. It's like, what do we, you know, or marriage counseling before you get married. Like there should be something like that for business um, to prevent it. Cause it, it's inevitable that over some period of time, you know, if the, you know, the bus the business goes South, that maybe doesn't matter so much, but I think sometimes it's almost worse when the business is successful and then it's, you know, the, the person you are or the other person may be different five or 10 years down the road from, yeah. from when you started. That's very true. You know, and it's kind of interesting, you know, that we, we kind of talk about some of the difficulties, but, you know, starting a business can have its rewarding moments as well. Right. What are some of those aspects that you found enjoyable uh, during throughout your entrepreneurial journey? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's about helping people and seeing the reviews about how it's changed people's lives or made their lives better. Or, you know, we got a, a message yesterday from a customer whose, you know, mother was, you know, really sick um, and struggling during COVID, but this kind of helped protect her. And this it said effectively kept her alive <laughs> during COVID because she was in this really clean environment. Um, and you know, you just see that over and over and over again. And to me, it's like, yeah, we're doing the right thing. Um, and so it, it's just making an impact in, in people's lives, I think is to me, that's what's, that's, what's rewarding. It's not about a sales number or, you know, I'm not a big ego kind of a person. Um, <laughs> and so maybe I'm not driven by the same things that others are, but you know, when you, when you see these things over and over again, it's just like, yeah, this is, you know, to me, I never would have dreamt I could even be in this position. You know, if I went back 20, 25 years ago, it's yeah. kind of mind boggling. 
You know, with, with that said, speaking of your current business, Orani specifically, what are, what are some of the significant hurdles that you've encountered starting this, even though you've already been in the air purification kind of world, what are some of the hurdles or, or difficulties or challenges that you've faced starting this new business? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a couple. I think anytime you start a business, nobody knows who you are. And it's like, gosh, how do you get your name out there? And so I fortunately, you know, had built up the other business, sold it, and then had money to start this business. So that helped with not having to go and spend time raising money. I had cash to get the business started. And I knew, you know, was focused on e-commerce and I and I understood how to market and sell on e-commerce. But with that said, when you're first starting out, nobody knows you. Like, like why would someone, you know? And so I think it's really important to um, understand um, the customer, what customer problem you're specifically solving and how you're doing that better than anyone else. And then getting that message out to just really starting off with a small group of people. It's about starting small and getting traction and momentum to be able to build and um, having expectations that you're not going to crush it day one. It's just more of a, you know, can you build a path and and get, you know, a little bit stronger every day. Um, and, and in terms of more recently, <laughs> the challenges um, with COVID, gosh, there, there's probably a hundred air purifier brands. And, you know, there used to be maybe 15, like five years ago. <laughs> it just, and so the competition has just gone, gone crazy. And, and Amazon's a huge marketplace and they've opened their arms to the Chinese factories. And so there's a lot of really low price stuff. And so that's that's been a bit of a challenge um, in terms of how do we get our message across and, and better connect with people with the the landscape just almost overnight, just, just radically changing. Yeah, and I think we see that in a lot of industries and I'm not trying to get on any political horse here, any folks, but it, we do see it in a lot of different industries where, uh, China is able to really undercut us in prices. A great example is the solar industry. Uh, you know, Solar World, out, you know, we live in Oregon. Uh, we have a lot mm-hmm. of solar plants here in the Oregon area that have struggled uh, because they're, a, they're competing against such low um, priced, high, you know, similar quality solar panels that are coming from overseas. And their tariffs, you know, we put tariffs on it, but it's still, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult thing. Um, so, you know, I guess so I would just encourage folks that are listening, hey, feel free to dig into the company a little bit, see where they're manufacturing. And, and if you prefer to buy locally, then make sure that you're you're digging in to kind of find that information. Now, with that said, Peter, what what goes into an air purifier? Like what exactly goes into these things? I mean, basically, it's it's a, a motor fan uh, filter in the housing is pretty much the, the parts. Um, and so, as I mentioned earlier, we merged with an electric motor company a couple of years ago. So we have a new electric motor technology that we're in the next month or two launching our first product. Um, and it's proprietary technology that's going to give us a lot of performance advantages as well as um, really cost competitive with the um, in Chinese imports specifically. Um, and so, um, you know, what we've seen is, you know, a HEPA filter is a HEPA filter. It's just almost a commodity. Um, and, and so, you know, there's an opportunity with the motor part, which is the engine, um, to have a difference. And so that's kind of where our energy and time has been focused. But that's that's the crux of what an air purifier is. It's basically just moving air through a filter and enough air to clean you know, the air in, in a given size room, it's pretty much all it is. But from an engineering perspective, it's a lot more challenging than than that sounds. Yeah, I'm assuming I've actually, if folks, if you have not yet, um, definitely check them out. In fact, we'll have the information on the newsletter. So please subscribe at the shades of e.com. We'll have this information. But really, the air, there's uh, Ronnie's air purifiers actually look really, really cool. In fact, they're they're growing. They actually have a, a facility out in Virginia. So folks, if you're listening and you're looking for a job, they are hiring local workers, I believe, out in that location. Uh, so they're, they are expanding. Now, one of the things, Peter, that you mentioned, too, is, is you, you did start this with your own funding, right? Mm-hmm. How did you how do you effectively scale a bootstrap, you know, small to medium sized business with no outside funding? Uh, it, cash flow is important <laughs> in terms of, you know, when you sell online, you, you get the money in a couple of days. Um, you know, if you sell through Amazon, 
you know, maybe it's 30 or 45 days. It's a bit of a longer, <laughs> a longer cycle, but they have a huge marketplace. And so, but if you saw, can sell through your own website and get traffic to your website and convert the traffic into orders, um, you can get cash in a, in a couple of days. And so it's about, you know, bringing in the right amount of inventory and managing your inventory um, turns pretty, pretty tightly um, to where, you know, you're effectively paying for the inventory by the time it comes. The other thing is negotiating payment terms. Um, if if you're not manufacturing yourself with your contract manufacturer to where, you know, the time that you have the product, ideally, if you could sell it before you have to pay for it, then it's, <laughs> you don't need a, a investor, say, for that or a, a bank. But, you know, for us, we grew organically and we grew through developing stronger bank relationships since we were profitable um, and that helps a lot um, but there's a point where if you want to grow faster you may need to bring in some outside capital or look at some other sources of capital just to um, you know there's kind of a limit to what banks will do they're they're <laughs> very conservative yes uh, and um, I've kind of got my PhD in how banks work over the last few years <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> and so I understand I used to be a little bit down on banks, but now I understand their business model is they they work off of really small margins. And so they can't afford to to take any really any kind of risk. Yep. And so they're, they're very, very conservative. It's not that they don't want to help you. Um, you know, there's this expression that, you know, the banks are with you when it's sunny. But as soon as it starts to rain, they take away your umbrella. <laughs> and. <laughs> and and it's because they, you know, their margins are so small. If they have someone that just goes south, um, it just is really impactful for them. And so they, they don't want to take any losses. And so it's, you, you pretty much have to be um, profitable. It's not, they're in their backwards looking. They're not forwards looking. So you can have this great forward looking projection, but they're like, okay, but all we look at is <laughs> yeah. what you've done recently. And, um, you know, if you want to go look forward looking, that's more of a, a VC type, right. type investment. I mean, that's kind of like Silicon Valley Bank, right? A great example mm -hmm. of where they took on too much risk and unfortunately it didn't pay off. Um, and, and, you know, there are other avenues of funding folks too, right? So there's a lot of great business accelerator programs out there, like the one we just recently created here in Oregon, the Latino Founders uh, Business Accelerator Program. We've earmarked uh, grant money for entrepreneurs. So you can come and you pitch your ideas during these business accelerators. And that's free money, right? Grant is nothing. You get. You don't have to pay it back. You can use it for operations costs. You can use it for marketing. You can use whatever, right? Uh, so those are other options for you to also think about. In fact, marketing. One of the things you mentioned, Peter, is, is, is you know, you, yes, you have the Amazon marketplace, but then you also have your own personal website that you're truly trying to draw volume. Let's talk about what are some, some of your best practices for direct-to-consumer marketing and digital marketing in 2003 for e-commerce businesses? Yeah, so what's interesting is I've been in e-commerce e marketing 25, almost 30 years, it, it has just changed dramatically <laughs> from what it used to be all those pop-ups that everybody hates and, it, <laughs> oh, man. You know, and then, you know, things have shifted to video. And I mean, it is, it's the one thing I've learned is you can't get married to what you're doing because what you're doing now may not work in two or three years. Very like true. you have to be open true. to trying what's new. And I think the opportunity or the lower cost attention is more on whatever is the newer platforms that people are going to. So marketing is really about just getting someone's attention you know, if you have a product or a service where you can demonstrate something that's very visual, then video is a fantastic opportunity. And you can run, you know, YouTube ads or um, if you're not getting organic traffic. And, and those can be even like five or 10 cents a click. It's 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 crazy how low price that is. Um, for, for our category, if you advertise the word air purifier on Amazon, it's like $20 a click. I mean, the math does not work. Like, <laughs> wow. you can't, like, our products are 200 or maybe 250. And even if you convert 10%, you're spending $200. Like, there's not enough. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really difficult. So I think it's understanding the economics of, of where you're advertising. Um, the, you know, and, and being able to convert people. And really what we're starting to do more is build 
this is a Seth Godin thing, but build marketing into the product. Because if you yeah. build marketing in the product and you solve someone's customer and they tell somebody about it, it doesn't cost you anything, yep. but you're, you're, you're just shifting it to like making a really great product. Um, and then finding ways to get the lower priced attention. Um, and right now that seems to be um, on video and there's some discovery and search ads on Google that can be um, lower priced, but it, it's, it's kind of hard to give specific advice since there's so much, you know, different variation yeah. <laughs> what people are making and selling. But, um, but I think it's, it's kind of building a tribe and starting small and, and, and getting traction within it and just kind of building or organically from there is, is ideally the best way. And then how do you, you mentioned price, you know, how do you, you know, cost effectively reassure manufacturing from China to the U S and optimize supply chain? Yeah, so it, it's it's really been kind of cr- crazy this last few years with because the uh, within our category at least the there's been 25 percent tariffs that have been put in place in the ocean shipping during COVID just went you know used to be you know we're on the east coast but it, it was three thousand to thirty five hundred for a container from China wow. and then it went up to as much as twenty two thousand for Jesus. that same container during COVID now it's back to where where it was before and so that was pretty painful when it went to twenty two thousand oh, for a container it and and then to have a twenty five percent tariff on top of that and so you know that's part of the reason that's really pushed us to reshore manufacturing um, and and source a lot of our components locally. It helps significantly from a cash flow standpoint because you know we if we can get net thirty or net sixty terms with a local supplier and sell it and get paid in two days, it's like <laughs> the the math is phenomenal. Like if whereas if you make something in China and then you ship it here it, to get to the East Coast, it could take like sixty days. Yeah, yeah. So there's just, there's just all that time you've invested on. Um, inventory that's on the water and then all the tariffs and, and, and it's just kind of, you know, it's, it's difficult. Um, And so the other thing that, you know, that we've been doing is really um, pushing our suppliers for lower, lower costs. And, and China is hurting right now. Like they're, they're they're down like 24%. They're desperate for business and you can push them for lower pricing. Um, you know, one thing is, you, you know, if you have tariffs, you're like, hey, I'm paying 25% more to sell your your widget um, that, you know, that you're making, you, you know, and the other the other thing you can do is really push out payment terms. You know, the, the issue with Chinese factories is initially there's no trust. And so they often make you prepay. Um, but as you develop a relationship and work with someone for some period of time, you can start to get net 30 terms, maybe net 60 terms. And that helps a lot in terms of the cash flow um, for your product. But, you know, to start, it's it's really difficult to do anything, but, you know, paying for that inventory and then, gosh, and then you <laughs> wait for it to to show up. So that that's a little bit that's a little bit tough for a new business, but it, it's kind of the it is what it is. Yeah. And it's, 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 it is interesting because I think shipping costs, when you think about, you know, small business and expansion, like our SMBs, right? Small and medium sized businesses. When you think about their expansion uh, and their growth, a lot of times it, it's, it's the funding that they, they, they grow, either they grow too fast, right? The operations couldn't catch mm-hmm. up or funding, yep. right? Everybody can continue on if they have the, enough money. Now, one of the things right. you kind of mentioned too, is, is these tariffs and the, the price of it, but you're also hoping to expand, right? To continue to grow. Yeah. So how right. do you expand sales beyond North America? What are some of those challenges uh, that you see and what are some of the benefits? Uh, you mean selling internationally? Correct. Yeah. Our focus right now is really the U S market. Um, you know, I've been looking at some of our competitors and, and these are global companies. And what's interesting is while they promote um, all the international selling that they do. If you look at their their um, financial reports, they're 75, 80% US sales. Like the US oh, market, like we're the ultimate consumers. Like, like, the, like the average European spends like 50, 60% less than an American. And so, you know, we do have plans to expand um, into Europe, but we've got much lower expectations. Yeah, makes for sense. What that market's going to produce. And it's also more expensive. 
if we're manufacturing here to sell over there because we have to ship the product and you have to do customer service and it's like it's a higher cost of doing business for a lower uh, amount of sales and so if, you know for us where i see probably more growth coming is introducing new products to the u.s market uh, and then you know kind of you know maybe two three years down the road doing a, a bit more internationally but we've kind of really almost retreated back to really focusing on on the u.s because you know, you can get excited about how many people live in a country or right. whatever, but it's like, or, you know, we had someone that tell me like, oh, these people, they save so much money. And I'm like, well, that's the problem. If you're saving money, <laughs> you're spending it, it's like, that's, we're in the job of selling. And it's like, it's, there's a problem there. And so the U S doesn't have that problem. It's, <laughs> it's, you know, it's, let's focus on the market that we know and the customers that we know, and there's no cultural issues no language issues and you know they spend more than than any other country on a per capita basis by far yeah and i think folks i think this is a great example of an entrepreneur doing their due diligence and really understanding product market fit right uh you might have the greatest solution to a problem that doesn't exist uh that's that's sometimes the problem with entrepreneurs uh, as well i know i've had career you don't have to crush it like the first year um the the goal of business is not really it's so much to win it's to stay in the game and so how do you keep playing i think that's the mindset that you have to have it's not that you need to destroy your competition or i think you need to uh, focus on the customer and stay in the game and keep the business afloat um and, and constantly reevaluate it um you know, is this, you know, is this making you happy? And is this what you really want to be doing? Like for me, I just have this mission to help people uh, breathe better. And, you know, I'm just committed to it. And I'll, I'll take the punches along the way. Uh, if you're not committed to it, you may not be, <laughs> may, may not be willing to put in what it takes. And, you know, not every day is sunshine and roses, <laughs> but, but for the most part, the, the, the most part, you know, um, to me, the journey is fun. Um, but, but there are bumps along the way and you just have to be able to, you know, kind of move beyond it and have perspective on you know, kind of why you're doing this and, and where you're going. Yeah. Very, very true. Now you mentioned you got some new product developments on the line. What, what's, what does, uh, the business look like in five years? Can you tell us what some of those products might be? Yeah. Um, well, I, I, we're, we're still, you know, getting the first air purifier out. And so we're very focused on that, but I would say our motor technology allows us to have an advantage where um, it's smaller size, it's higher torque um, and quieter. And so if you can think of, you know, you know, we're looking at the consumer market. So kitchen appliances where that would be an advantage or even the home and garden type products, especially as, is certain products move from fossil fuel or gas based to electric. Yeah. Great like point. our motor technology is perfect for that. Yeah. Uh, 
you know, and it's going to, it's in the process of being patented. So, you know, it's really going to differentiate us um, in the marketplace. If you have something that just spins faster, blows air better, <laughs> um, there, there's, there's, there's no shortage of um, options for us. It's just, um, we're, we're still in the process of identifying, like, what do we want to do next? And then, you know, mapping that out. But, you know, really right now is, you know, we're just setting up a whole new factory production line. We're making the motors, we're assembling the air purifier. Um, you know, I think once, once that's done in two or three months, we're going to quickly move on to the next product, which will, my guess is probably a kitchen appliance, but I see us, really branching off into a number of different categories. I love it. And, you know, folks listening again, if you are in the Virginia area, uh, they are in fact hiring, I believe out there at their workshop. So go ahead and look that up too. check out the, check out the purifier. I think this is a really cool thing. Um, I'm probably going to look at it because again, my wife has asthma. Our kids are, you know, they have allergies. We live in Oregon. It, it rains pollen out here. So if you if you ever been out here, you guys know that. Now, now uh, Peter, for the listeners at home, how can they find you if they want to learn more about your business? How can they find you either on the website uh, or social media? Where is your information lie? Sure. Yeah, our website is aransi.com. It's O-R-A-N-S-I.com. And I'm on LinkedIn at Peter Mann, M-A-N-N. Um, yeah, happy to, to chat with anyone. Perfect. In fact, this is a great time because all this information will be on the Shades of Entrepreneurship newsletter. So great time to plug the newsletter. If you are not subscribed yet, please check out theshadesofe.com. You can go ahead and subscribe to the newsletter there. You can also follow us at the Shades of E on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, and TikTok. We've been creating some rails, so please go ahead and like those. And soon we'll go ahead and put some, uh, some marketing stuff on YouTube. So go ahead and be looking out for that. Now, Peter, is there any last word you'd like to say for the listeners? Ooh, I mean, I think I'll just repeat what I what I said before is is build marketing into the product. I think it, it's so competitive that you can spend a lot of money in advertising very quickly. It's a lot better if you have a product that actually solves a customer problem that that the the customer would be willing to tell somebody about, and that's that's really hard to do. But you, it just life is so much simpler. Um, you know, because the ad costs can, you know, can, can eat, eat you, <laughs> can take away all and more of the profit. Yes. That's a very great point. In fact, folks listening, create a story around your product, create, you know, Peter done a great job about creating a story, talked about his, his son that draws people in. Uh, it really makes people feel like, oh, this individual is really focused on quality and making it efficient because they're using it for their own personal self as well. And you can see the passion, right? You can you can hear the passion coming out from Peter really wanting to make this thing work. Uh, and I think that's another thing to think about, too. You know, uh, you, Peter mentioned it. Find what you're passionate about. You know, once you find that, you'll go from your zone of competence to your zone of genius, right? Because then you start doing something that time just flies by. You're working on a project. All of a sudden it was four hours later and you're, you're just like, wow, I just been having such a good time doing this. I didn't even notice the time was that's when you're on in your zone of genius. Right. And so that's really when you begin to take off. So, again, folks. Don't be afraid to try new things. Go out there, experience, uh, travel, read, uh, drink plenty of water because that's another thing we need to start doing often. Peter, thank you again so much for being on the show. I really do appreciate it. I'm really excited for you and what you're going to be doing in the future. Um, folks listening, again, please follow me at The Shades of E on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and, or TikTok, and Instagram. Have a great night. Thank you for tuning in to The Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow The Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.